I have 11 sons. The first is outwardly very plain, but serious and clever. Yet although I love him as I love all my children, I do not rate him very highly. His mental processes seem to me to be too simple. He looks neither to the right nor to the left, nor into the far distance. He runs round all the time, or rather revolves, with his own little circle of thoughts. The second is handsome, slim, well made. One draws one breath with delight to watch him with a fencing foil. He is clever too, but has experience of the world as well. He has seen much, and therefore even our native country seems to yield more secrets to him than to the stay at home. Yet I'm not sure that this advantage is not only and not even essentially due to his travels. It is rather an attribute of his own inevitable nature, which is acknowledged for instance by everyone who has ever tried to copy him in. Let us say the fancy high dive he does into the water, uh, somersaulting several times over, yet with almost violent self-control. To the very end of a springboard, the emulator keeps up his courage and his desire to follow, but at the point, instead of leaping into the air, he sits down suddenly and lifts his arms in excuse, and despite all this, I ought really to feel blessed with such a son. My attachment to him is not untroubled. His left eye is a little smaller than his right and blinks a good deal. Only a small fall, certainly, and one which even lends more audacity to his face that he would otherwise have not, considering his unapproachable self-sufficiency, would anyone think of noticing and finding fault with this smaller eye and the way it blinks. Yet I, his father, do so. Of course, it is not the physical blemish that worries me, but a small irregularity of the spirit that somehow corresponds to it, a kind of a stray poison in the blood, a kind of inability to develop to the full of the potentialities of his nature, which I alone can see. On the other hand, this is just what makes him again my own true son. For this fault of his is a fault of our whole family, and in him it is only too apparent. My third son is handsome too, but not in a way that I appreciate. He has the good looks of a singer, the curving lips, the dreamy eyes, the kind of head that asks for drapery behind it to make it effective. The two deeply arched chests, hands that are quick to fly up and much too quick to fall limp. Legs that move delicately because they cannot support weight. And besides, the tone of his voice is not round and full. It takes you in for a moment. The connoisseur picks, pricks up his ears, but almost as once his breath gives out, although in general, everything attempts me to bring this son of mine into the limelight. I prefer to keep him in the background. He himself is not insistent, yet not because he is aware of his shortcomings, but out of innocence. Moreover, he does not feel at home in our age, as if he admitted belonging to our family, yet knew that he belonged also to another, which he has lost forever. He is often melancholy, and nothing can cheer him. My fourth son is perhaps the most companionable of all, a true child of his age. He is understood by everyone. He stands on what is common ground to all men, and everyone feels inclined to give him a nod. Perhaps this universal appreciation is what makes his nature rather facile, his movements rather free, his judgments rather unconcerned. 
many of his remarks are worth quoting over and over again, but by no means all of them, for by and large, his extreme facility becomes irritating. He is like a man who makes a wonderful takeoff from the ground, cleaves the air like a swallow, and after all, comes down helplessly uh, in a de desert waste, a nothing. Such reflections gall me when I look at him, my fifth son. <clears throat> He's kind and good, uh, promised less than he performed, used to be so insignificant that one literally felt alone in his presence, but has achieved a certain reputation. If I were to ask how this came about, I could hardly tell you. Perhaps innocence makes its way easiest through the elemental chaos of the world, and innocence he certainly is, perhaps too innocent, friendly to everyone, perhaps too friendly, I confess. I don't feel comfortable when I hear him praised. It seems to make praise rather too cheap to bestow it on anyone so obviously praiseworthy as a son of mine. My sixth son. At first class, anyone, anyhow, the most thoughtful of all, he is giving to hanging his head, and yet he is a great talker. So it's not easy to get at. If he is on the downgrade, he falls into impenetrable melancholy. If he is on the ascendant, he maintains his advantage by sheer talk. Yet I grant him a certain self-forgetful, passionate exhaustion in the full light of day. He often fights his way through a tangle of thoughts as if in a dream. Without being ill, his health, on the contrary, is very good. He sometimes staggers, especially in the twilight, but he needs no help. He never falls. Perhaps his physical growth is the cause of this phenomenon. He is much too tall for his age. That makes him look ugly in general, although he has remarkable beauty in detail, in hands and feet, for instance. His forehead, too, is ugly, both in its skin and bone formation are somehow arrested in their development. The seventh son belongs to me perhaps more than all the others. The world would not know how to appreciate him. It does not understand his peculiar blend of wit. I do not overvalue him. I know he is of little importance. If the world had no other fault than that of not appreciate him, it would still be blameless. But within the family circle, I should not care to be without this son of mine. He contributes a certain restlessness as well as reverence for tradition and combines them both, at least that is how I feel it, into an incontestable whole. True, he knows less than anyone what to do with this achievement. The wheel of fortune will never be started rolling by him. But his disposition is so stimulating, so rich in hope. I wish that he had children and children's children. Unfortunately, he does not even incline to fulfill my wish with a self-satisfaction that I understand as much as I deplore and which stands in magnificent contrast to the verdict of the world. He goes everywhere alone, pays no attention to girls, and yet will never lose his good humor. My eighth son is my child of sorrow, and I do not really know why. He keeps me at a distance, and yet I feel a close paternal tie binding him to me. Time has done much to lessen the pain, but once I use often to trouble, uh, tremble at the more th mere thought of it. He got his own way. He has broken off all communication with me. And certainly with his hard head, his small athletic body, only his legs were rather frail when he was a boy, but perhaps that has meanwhile righted itself. He will make a success of anything he chooses. 
Many a time I used to want to call him back to ask him how things really were with him, why he cut himself off so completely from his father, and what his fundamental purpose was in life. But now he is so far away, and so much time has passed that things had better stay as they are. I hear that he is the only one of my sons to grow a full beard. That cannot look well, of course, on a man so small as he is. My ninth son is a very elegant and has what women consider a def definitely melting eye. So melting that there are occasions when he can also control even me, although I know that a wet sponge is literally enough to wipe away all the unearthly brilliance. But the curious thing about the boy is that he makes no attempt to be seductive. He would be content to spend his life lying on the sofa and uh, wasting his glances on the ceiling, or still better, keep them to himself under his eyelids. When he is lying in his favorite position, he enjoys talking and talks quite well, concisely and pith pitifully, but still only within narrow limits. Since once he oversteps these, which he cannot avoid doing since they are so narrow, what he says is quite empty. One would sign him to uh, stop if one had any hope that such uh, slumberous eyes were even aware of the gesture. My tenth son is supposed to be an insincere character. I shall not entirely deny or confirm that uh, supposition. Certainly anyone who sees him approaching with the pomposity of a man twice his age in a frock coat always tightly buttoned an old but a meticulously brushed back black hat with an expressionless face, slightly jetting chin, protruding eyelids that mask the light behind them, two fingers very often at his lips. Anyone seeing him this is bound to think, what an utter hypocrite. But then just listen to him talking with understanding, thoughtfully, brusquely, Cutting across questions with satirical vivacity, in complete accord with the universe, an accord that is surprising, natural, and gay, an accord that of necessity straightness the net and makes the body proud. Many who think themselves very clever and for this reason, as they fancy, felt a dislike for his outward appearance have become strongly attached to him because of his uh, conversation. These are other people again who are unaffected by his appearance but who find his conversation hypocritical. I, being his father, will not pronounce a verdict but I must admit that the latter critics are at least to be taken more seriously than the former. My eleventh son is delicate, probably the frailest of my sons, but deceptive in his weakness, for at times he can be strong and resolute. Though even then, there is sometimes how always an underlying weakness, yet it is not a weakness to be ashamed of, merely something that appears as with weakness only on this solid earth of ours. For instance, is not a readiness for a flight a kind of weakness too, since it uh, consists in wavering, an unsteadiness, a fluttering, something of that nature characterizes my son. These are not, of course, the characteristics to rejoice a father. They tend, obviously, to destroy a family. Sometimes it looks at me as if he would say, I shall take you with me, father. Then I think, you are the last person I would trust myself to. And again, his look seemed to say, then let me be at least the last. These are my 11 sons. <laughs> uh, 
All right. So uh, we'll discuss the story of uh, the 11 sons. And uh, the major thing I'm, I really want to say about it is that uh, the, uh, the father who uh, is trying to record his sons uh, and the, the talk about what they are like and all that and and starts off in each son and starts off to to say what is very good about that son but then as he gets to to the end of this lesson he says but that son is really not so perfect at all uh, and point starts to point out in each of the sons what their faults were even though they had everything very good is the way he describes it initially but at the end always points out a fault that negates everything that he said that was good about them and uh that is something uh, i don't think a father would be able to do unless uh, he himself was very faultful <laughs> and uh so i would say that uh uh that's what's interesting about the story to me i mean that that he's really the father is really being analyzed by what he's saying about his sons and uh, and so i i think uh, th that story has has that value and all right so that's it <laughs>